God's house of prayer in his house in heaven. The northern kingdom of Samaria was inhabited by Gentiles imported by the Assyrians who had defeated the Israelites of the north before the Assyrians were defeated by the Babylonians. The Babylonians, who later defeated the southern kingdom of Judah and deported them to the lands of Assyria, Babylonia, eventually Persia, completed the total exile of the 13 tribes of Israel from the lands of Abraham. Uh, the North Kingdom was also called Israel, uh, of course Samaria, and Ephraim. Then the king of Assyria marched against the whole land. He came to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hoshi, the king of Assyria captured Samaria. He deported the Israelites to Assyria and settled them in Hala, at the river Habor, at the river Gazan, and in the towns of Medea. That's 2 Kings, chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kuta, Abba, Hamak, and Sepharvan, and he settled them in the towns of Samaria in place of the Israelites. They took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its towns. That's 2 Kings, 17, verse 24. They worshiped the Lord, but they also appointed from their own ranks priests of the shrines who officiated for them in the cult places. They worshiped the Lord while serving their own gods, according to the practices of the nations from which they had been deported. To this day, they follow their former practices. They do not worship the Lord properly. They do not follow the laws and practices, the teaching and instruction that the Lord enjoined upon the descendants of Jacob, who was given the name Israel, with whom he made a covenant and whom he commanded, you shall worship no other gods. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. That's 2 Kings, chapter 17, verse 32 through 35. God said, As for the foreigners <clears throat> who attach themselves to the Lord to minister to Him and to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and who hold fast to my covenant, I will bring them to my sacred mount and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices shall be welcome on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. That's Isaiah chapter 56, verses 6 through 7. In Judaism today, this would mean converting to Judaism applied to foreigners including Christian Israelis and Muslim Israelis. If they want to enter the third temple, they must hold fast to God's covenant with the Jewish people. They must follow the laws and practices, the teaching and instruction that the Lord enjoined upon the descendants of Jacob, who was given the name Israel, with whom he made the covenant. A house of prayer for all people is a house of prayer for all Jewish people who are people from the nations of the earth. God knew they would be defeated, deported, and dispersed throughout the world. This was a part of God's plan when he formed Israel. For the new heaven he was creating. He chose them and the land for them and had the Hebrew Bible in its entirety written at his command and direction through his anointed ones and his prophets. God 
is creating a new heaven of the spirits and souls of the Jewish people for the name of Israel to endure. Those who are righteous and in right standing with him will be placed in angelic bodies as a new host of the Lord of hosts, a host of angels representing the people of the world, the angels of Israel. And that's why it's a house of prayer for all peoples, all Jewish people. And you can't be worshiping false gods as those that have been imported in the northern kingdom. Eli Weasel said in regard to God in the Holocaust in the lost version of night. Quote, this time we will not stand as the accused in court before the divine judge. This time we are the judges. And he is the accused. We are ready. There are a huge number of documents in our indictment file. They are living documents that will shape the foundations of justice. Job was also ready to indict God. Job wanted God to explain to him why he, as a righteous man who followed the Lord's commandments, has so many bad things happening to him. I am sure that God is quite pleased with creation because he is perfect. And all things he creates are perfectly what he wanted for him. It is perfect for creating a heaven of angelic human spirit persons. A new heaven by the addition of a new host of angels, angels Israel. God decided to create a new host of angels, one where he does not create their personalities. It's with the angels of heaven, but angelic persons who were formed as persons by their own ashes and self-will. Unlike angels, we are put through a battleground of choices with our own self-will that molds and shapes us as persons. Angels do not have self-will or a battleground of choices to make. Their persons are created and formed by God. God knew in the beginning that all men would suffer, the good and the bad. It is what makes our personality suitable for His purpose of creating a new host of angels. Quote, For behold, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered. They shall never come to mind. Be glad then and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I shall create Jerusalem as a joy and her people as a delight. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in her people. Never again shall be heard there the sounds of weeping and wailing. It's Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 19. Quote, No more shall there be an infant or graybeard who does not live out his days. He who dies at a hundred years shall be reckoned a youth, and he who fails to reach a hundred shall be reckoned a curse. They shall build houses and dwell in them. They shall plant vineyards and enjoy their fruit. They shall not build for others to dwell in or plant for others to enjoy. For the days of my people shall be as long as the days of a tree. My chosen ones shall outlive the work of their hands. They shall not toil to no purpose. They shall not bear children for terror, but they shall be a people blessed by the Lord, and their offspring shall remain with them. That's Isaiah chapter 65, verses 20 through 23. And there's a reason I broke it up like that, because it could have all gone together. <coughs> In verses 17 through 19, God is speaking of a spiritual heaven that he calls Jerusalem. Verses 20 through 23 are what heaven was believed to be like for the people of the ancient age and the Middle Ages. God's scripture, scripture is written for eras gone by, and heirs to come. 
People of ancient times in the Middle Ages thought of the dead coming back to life and living long lives in a brutal, savage time of humanity. Planting vineyards and enjoying the fruit and not having it taken by others, dwelling in a home they had built, and not toiling for others was the heaven they thought of, not a spiritual heaven where you rise to God and live with Him. To them, God was always angry and the cause of their troubles. I mean, if you think about it, with no medicine, no science, no knowledge, no schooling, no universities, when you had lost your loved one, the spouse would walk out to the graveside and just go, I wish you could come up out of there and come back to me. That's, how, that's as far as they could think of it. They, they weren't thinking, I wish you got into the hospital, I wish you had eaten better foods. Which you hadn't drank so much. So it was just, I wish you could come out of the ground and be with me. That's heaven to them. And today it's still prayed for by Orthodox as a fundamental principle of, of Judaism in the 13 principles of Rambam. Billions of people is what you're talking about appearing out of nowhere in the land of Israel. I don't know that you could fit them all in. For as the new heaven and the new earth, which I shall make, shall endure by my will, declares the Lord, so shall your seed and your name endure. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22. God says he is creating a new heaven and a new earth. The new earth will be just as this is, earth is, when this earth is no more, when the final judgment of entry to heaven is made by the Creator, who holds the souls of all men in his hand. The new heaven where the seed and name of Israel shall endure. And God will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in her people while the new earth is being formed. God calls the new heaven Jerusalem as a direct reference to heaven being for the Jewish people where the name Israel shall endure. Quote, I am sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him, for he will not pardon your offenses, since my name, Hashem, is in him. But if you obey him and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. Genesis chapter 23 verses 23 22. In heaven, God is in you as my name is in the angel of his presence. That is what is meant when God says, Before they pray, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will respond. The information of our minds gathered by our eyes and ears is interpreted by our spirit and soul. Interpreted. It's not where your thoughts are. If that's true, there can be no heaven for any of us because our mind turns to dust. The spirit that God gives us, an element of the unseen realm of God, literally translates the little electrical signals and the chemicals and the, the, the tissue of the brain in different areas, different loads which is the person that we are, our spirit and soul. Our spirit can read the electrical impulses, chemicals, and different tissues of various parts of the mind. In heaven, our spirit and soul no longer has a mind filled with information to interpret. Spirit is very complicated element of the unseen realm of God. God will be the source of that information. In a sense, God becomes your mind. He provides the information for your spirit to interpret. God can be the information of your mind and the information for every angel and spirit of heaven at the same time. Jesus tells us that he will return in the time of lies and being. The life of the high priest. Oh, uh. I've been asked to, to tell you that uh, I have a lot more on this um, 
God providing the information of your mind in a video um, that is Messianic era versus day of the Lord. That's, there might be a little, few, few more words, but it's Messianic era versus day of the Lord. Uh, which is it? What's it going to be? Well, I don't think there's any question it's going to be day of the Lord. They don't go together. Jesus tells us that he will return in the times of lies and being. The life of the high priest who will see him return. The lives of the people of the towns of Caesarea Philippi, then living. The generation of lies and being during his life. The lives of his disciples. And the lives of those who pierced him with the spear after he died on the cross. They're all dead now for 2,000 years. Jesus spoke five prophecies of his return with a specific time frame, lives in being, the measuring lives, and the prophecies all fail. The Apostle Paul said, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That, of course, is the rapture. And that just came from Paul. And that's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 17 of the Holy Bible, King James Version. Jesus said he was coming back quickly. On the last page of the Holy Bible, in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. This went over five to fail. I don't know how much faith you want to put in there. Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelation Chapter 22, verse 12. He which testified these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Revelation, chapter 22, verse 20. There's three more prophecies that did not come true. Of course, he's already gone at this time, but he still doesn't come back. And he's talking from heaven through an angel to a writer called John. He may... By all accounts, it's not John the disciple. Uh, although he tries to indicate it is him. Jesus has never returned. For almost 2,000 years, the dead in Christ and those alive during those years have waited to rise to heaven. His prophetic announcement did not happen. There are no Christians in heaven, according to Christianity. I don't think any of them even know that. <laughs> the time for a quick return has long passed. There is no reason or foundation to believe by faith or otherwise that he will ever return. Heaven is only for the Jewish people. If the Christians want to enter God's house of prayer on earth and his house in heaven, they will have to convert to Judaism. They will have to become Jews. Very observant Jews. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. The commentary of Rashi and myself on Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15, and all of Isaiah 53, describing God's righteous servant, the Moshiach. According to my commentary, which includes commentary on the commentary of Russia. Russia's commentary is that the man being described is Israel, which means it's not the Moshiach of chapter 11. And which also means we have no description of him. 
52.13 Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up. And he shall be very high. Rashi. This is Midrash form. He takes parts of verses and comments on the parts. And he'll, he doesn't necessarily take all the verse, but the parts he wants to comment on. And this is how he starts. Behold, my servant shall prosper. Behold, this is Rashi now. Behold, at the end of days, my servant Jacob, i.e., the righteous among him, shall prosper. Keep. And I'm using the JPS. Uh, this is from Shabbat.org. Those are, they have the rendition that doesn't include the quotes between 13 and 15 and the quotes between verse 1 and 6 of uh, 53, the multiple quote verses. But this is from the JPS. Indeed, my servant shall prosper, be exalted, and raised to great heights. My commentary on that is, my servant is now the Gentile, and not the Gentiles, who becomes my righteous servant in Isaiah 53, 11, after passing the test of devotion in Isaiah 53, 10. When he makes himself an offering for guilt in the covenant with God. From a sinful man whose life had been lowly, full of grievous events and serious injuries, a man of pain and suffering, familiar with disease, that the Spirit of God alights upon, to the crown of God's righteous servant who rises to great heights. This is uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. Chapter 11 begins with, Spirit of God alights upon the tree, of the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse, where the ancestral tree of the kings of Judah has been cut down. That would be the line of Jesus in the book of Matthew. First thing you read in the New Testament. He can't be the man of chapter 11. That's not just because that line was banished with Chaconia, when Babylonia took over, uh, defeated the Jews, and destroyed the second temple. But because he doesn't come from the sun, that's why it's written that way. The stock of Jesse that has remained standing shall become a standard to peoples. Nations shall seek his counsel, and his abode shall be honored. Again, Isaiah 11.10. The abode of the righteous servant is humble when the Lord cuts him off from the land of the living, the world of material things in society, in Isaiah 53, verse 8. And in the end, the abode of the servant is one to be honored, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. From a poor man to a rich man, with the many as his portion, and the multitude as his spoil, prosperous and held in high regard by many, and a multitude of the Jewish people. Verse 14. As many wondered about you, how marred his appearance is from that of a man, and his features from that of people. Russian. That's, that's again, from Shabbat.org's, and, and the commentary comes from, from them, too. They have the commentary of Rashi on that. As many wondered, his answer, commentary, as many peoples wondered about them when they saw them in their humble state and said to one another, how marred is his, Israel's, as in brackets, appearance from that of a man. See how their features are darker than those of other people? So, as we see with our eyes, Keith, verse 14, just as the many were appalled at him, 
So long was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. Commentary. So marred was his appearance, unlike that of man. Based on Isaiah 53, verse 10, and its primary purpose, this is the beginning of identifying the righteous servant as a man with disfigurement, blemished, with disease. He is not a man without defect, such as lambs, sin offerings, and rams, or guilt offerings. In the Torah, that would be Leviticus. If I were to be seen with all of my injuries from accidents and surgical operations at one time before he, together with my con congenital disfigurement, my right shoulder and arm is withered, my appearance and features would be marred from that of a man and people, unlike that of normal men. That's important because. If he can find a way to describe, to describe uh, this man as so marred and his parents, I mean, it sounds like somebody you never want to look upon him. But in this verse, verse 15, it is said, So shall he cast down many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for what had not been told them they saw. And what they had not heard, they gazed. Russia. What had not been told them. His answer, commentary. Concerning any man, they saw in him. They gazed. So shall he cast down many nations. Uh, he just puts a Hebrew word in here. I, I don't know. They gazed. It says Hebrew, Hebrew letters, and then again he says they gaze. So shall he cast down many nations. Rashi. So now, even he, his hand, will become powerful. And he will cast down the horns of the nations who scattered him. That would be the Jewish people scattering the nations. Becoming powerful shall shut. They shall shut their mouths out of great bewilderment for, he says, honor. They're going to shut their mouths, all this, uh, see what they had never uh, been told and hear what they had never heard or honor. Keep. Just so he shall startle many nations, kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. My answer to that, nations, the Gentiles, startled, and kings, leaders of nations, silence. By seeing God's righteous servant, God's servant David, Elijah and the prophet like Moses as one name. And hearing that God's righteous servant arise in the time to come of Jeremiah 31 in the day of the Lord. That God's righteous servant is the only man to come who is described in the scripture and is inherently and implicitly the anointed one David, Elijah, the prophet like Moses, of whom there is no description for identification, that the Jewish people throughout the world will be forgiven by God of all their inequities and sins by God's written word in the day of the Lord. That would be the new part of the new covenant, the new inclusion from Jeremiah 31. That heaven is being created for only the Jewish people. Christians will be surprised at that as well, Muslims. That God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is a Gentile, according to the scripture. That Jesus, being a Jew, cannot be God's righteous servant. That God's righteous servant is familiar with disease and crushed with disease, blemished, and could never be an offer for sacrifice. 
No man of Isaiah 53 can fit and offer sacrifice. That's why God blesses him. That's why God chooses to crush him with disease. To make sure that just doesn't happen. Because he knew what the Gentiles were going to do with Leviticus. Then the host of the Lord's host is a man in divine beings. The captain of the Lord's host is a Gentile host of the Lord's host and a harbinger of God's righteous servant. The God's righteous servant becomes a man in divine beings when God's spirit, who is the angel of his presence, and he is a person, the angel of the Lord, the Holy Spirit alights upon him in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, that God would really redeem the Jewish people and in the same manner that he did in the Hebrew Bible with one man. At the time to come of Jeremiah 31 began when the state of Israel was created in 1948. The God's righteous servant fulfills and completes the remaining six or so prophecies of God in the day of the Lord. Okay, this is uh, Isaiah 53, verse 1, begins with quotes, and the quotes end after verse 6. The first speakers of Isaiah 53 are the witnesses of the righteous servant in the quoted multiple verses 1 through 6, the many who are made righteous by God's righteous servant. That's what the story is about. Verse 1, who would have believed our report and to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? Rashi. Who would have believed our report? Rashi. Commentary. So will the nations say to one another, were we to hear from others what we see, it would be unbelievable. I'm not certain what they see, but I think it's the Messianic era. This is never going to occur. So I don't know how you can base your opinions, and I know Jews for Judaism for sure doesn't. That's so much totally saying of outreach Judaism. If you're going to base a description on a man you're trying to find on an event that has not occurred, whether it will or will not, what about the man who's being described if that is the case? What have you done? What if you don't recognize him other than destruction comes to the land of Israel? And right now, that would be the destruction of 7 million Israeli Jews. If you have been told by a prophet, both of you two, Jews for Jews, you, outright Jews. If, if your organizations have been told by a prophet, God said he was going to raise up on us if we didn't do this and we didn't do that. And we know what happened. Syria, the field, the port of the North Kingdom, South Kingdom, Judah, the Babylonians defeated and deported, and then Rome destroyed and defeated all of them and dispersed the Jews throughout the world. Because why? Because the prophet wasn't listening to it. The arm of the Lord, this is still Rashi, like this, with greatness and glory, to whom was it revealed until now? It's not a lot of explanation there, I'm not sure. Keith, who can believe what we have heard? Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? My commentary. The witnesses ask, who can believe that God redeems the Jewish people by the new covenant with sin forgiveness? that is delivered by the messenger Elijah, who receives it from the angel of the covenant, Elijah being a man of heaven, of course, who is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, that alights upon the anointing one. In Isaiah chapter 11, 1 through 2. By the covenant of friendship that comes with his servant David, when he, and it's God, sanctifies Israel by having the third temple built on his holy Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Let's see, lost track here a little bit. Oh, who can believe what we have heard? Okay, that's what all these buys.
by speaking to his prophet. Again, as he spoke to Moses face to face and friend to friend. And all by and with one man the Lord calls my righteous servant. Chapter 12 of the laws concerning King Moshiach the Ramah. That Moshiach will compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah, perfect the entire world, motivating all the nations to serve God together. There will be neither famine nor war, neither envy nor competition. The entire world will be solely to know God. And the Jews will, therefore, be great sages and know the hidden matters with an understanding of their Creator to the full extent of human potential. Yet God simply says, and this comes through the two covenants of friendship in the sentence uh, in Jeremiah 31, see a time is coming, Jerusalem is rebuilt. At the end of that it says, they shall never be defeated and dispersed again. Here's what those say for the day of the Lord, the era of the Moshiach, or the times of the anointed one in the Awesome, fearful day of the Lord. Yet God simply says he will send down the rain in its season. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the land shall yield its produce. The Jewish people shall continue secure on their own soil, never be overthrown and uprooted again. They shall no longer be a spoil for the nations. He will establish for them a planting of renown. And again, this kind of go in hand with see that the time is coming, the desolate land will bloom again, as I paraphrase it, of Jeremiah 31. They shall no more be carried off by famine. They shall have to bear again. They shall not have to bear again the taunts of the nations. He will establish them and multiply them. He will place his sanctuary among them forever. His presence shall rest over them. And when his sanctuary abides among them forever, the nations will know that the Lord sanctifies Israel. Who would believe that one man fulfills and completes the remaining prophecies of God in the day of the Lord? The remaining prophecy to be fulfilled is the delivery of two specific covenants and the arrival of God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous. The anointed one, a shepherd, God calls my servant David. Elijah, who is taken to heaven and returns, and recounsels the members of the Jewish families one to the other through Judaism, Judaism, and righteousness. And the prophet like Moses, who wrote the Torah at the command and direction of God. The witnesses were poor and who would believe them that they had not been told by their wise men, sages, rabbis, theologians, that God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is a Gentile. In the beginning. Isaiah 63 says God comes from the dawn that is interpreted in Judaism to be Christianity, and means he is coming from a Christian country. Uh, in addition, a dawn, uh, which is long since gone, is in the country of Jordan, east of the River Jordan, it's Gentile lands. He's coming from Gentile lands. And there are the people, the Jewish people, none are with him. He comes with a Gentile. Remember the captain of the Lord's host. Joshua asked him, are you an Israelite or one of us? He says, no. I'm the captain of the Lord's host. Now I've come. And then we never see him again. It's just three short verses. What are they about? They're about a man and divine being being a host of the Lord's host. He comes with a Gentile. Well, Jesus was a Jewish man who came from Nazareth. Can you see God working in this? <laughs> the Jewish people. Isaiah 53 can't be him. He's a Jew. And God comes with a Gentile. It's not like I mean, Cyrus of Persia was a Gentile. Elijah's a Gentile. He, he's, he's, he, he's a Tishbite. You can't find a clan of Tishbites in any of the tribes according to the genealogies provided and 
He is an inhabitant. He's not from. He lives in Ramat Gilead. Just to give you a frame of reference, he may as well have lived in Adam. It's a, it's a territory east of the River Jordan, north of Adam, and it's Arabs and Assyrians. And he lives there. The Jewish people did not come from Adam. They began the Promised Land, returned from Egypt in the Exodus, and were not allowed to pass through Adam. Huh. And returned from Europe after the Holocaust. Well, how's God coming anywhere if he doesn't have a man with him? How do we know anything about him if a man doesn't speak the words God tells him to speak? Did you think it was going to be a day of the Lord and he wasn't going to have a Moses? He's got a new covenant to deliver. It has to do with the first covenant. Well, who delivered it? Moses. It can't be the Jewish people. Okay, he's got to have a guy. One man, and he's got him described. He's a servant, he's righteous. So was King David, so was Elijah, and so was Moses. All servants, all righteous. One term, God's righteous servant. And I'm to believe from Rashi, Jews from Judaism, outreach Judaism, that today the Jews are the righteous servant. Good luck convincing me. The witness report that they had never heard that the captain of the Lord's host is a Gentile and a harbinger of God's righteous servant who becomes the host of the Lord's host. It's, it's easy to understand. A man of divine beings is not an angel. A man of divine beings is a man that the Spirit alights upon and like Ezekiel enters, God is in his spirit and then he speaks. We get that from Ezekiel. Chapter 11, Isaiah. Spirit of God and lights upon him. God is in his spirit. He is now a man of divine beings. Any prophet that said God says in his books was a man of divine beings. You know, it's a task. It can be one task. It can be many tasks. One man just had to wrestle with Jeffrey. And God spoke. The divine beings, I know Judaism doesn't recognize the Holy Spirit for some unknown reason as a person. I don't know what could be more clear. It's just too many scriptural references. But that's a man of divine beings. Spirit lines on him. God's right there too. It's a man of divine beings, not an angel. The witness had never heard that the divine beings are the Holy Spirit who is the angel of his presence of Isaiah 63. An angel whose angelic body is not the form of a human with wings, but the very spirit of God. And God, the very angel who went before the Israelites in the Exodus, and God was in him. Quote, this is God. I'm sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him, for he will not pardon your offenses since my name is Hashem. Since Hashem is in him. But if you obey him and do all that I say, that would be God, not me. I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. That's Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 through 22. The witnesses who have never heard that God created his spirit is in his spirit, and his spirit is the body of the angel of his presence and the angel of the Lord. How the angel of the Lord is in the burning bush and God speaks to Moses. How a man divine beings wrestled with Jacob and God spoke to Jacob, renaming him Israel. How the ground was holy where Joshua fell to the ground before a Gentile with drawn sword and asked, What does my Lord command his servant? The captain of the Lord's host answered Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Joshua chapter 5, 14 through 15. Those are the very words God spoke to Moses at the burning bush. The Lord is with the captain, and where the Lord is, so is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, a man in divine beings. How Elijah the Tishbite, an inhabitant of Ramoth and Gilead, 
an Arab Assyrian town and land east of the river of Jordan, is also a Gentile host of the Lord's host. Okay, this was a little involved, and I'm really trying to press through it. So I'll, I'll just uh, refer you to the book where this comes from. It's called Isaiah 53, in the Day of the Lord. It's about 280-some-odd pages. It has a long, almost 35-page summary of one paragraph of each chapter, which is uh, really helpful. But it's, it's a lot more than just Isaiah 53. <clears throat> and God dictated it to me, as he dictated the Torah to Moses. Now Ezekiel is the host of the Lord's host, a man in divine names. This is uh, Ezekiel, it's in quotes. I'll give you the chapter and verse in a second. And he said to me, O mortal, stand on your feet that I may speak to you. As he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. And I heard what was being spoken to me. To God, they show God saying those words, but see, you can't hear them. So the Spirit is in him, and God is in his Spirit. He tells us, the angel, obey him, because my name, I am in him. This is God speaking to Ezekiel, but Ezekiel does not hear God speaking until at the same moment the Spirit enters him and sits him upon his feet. A spirit of God entering a man and God speaking means the angel of God's presence, who is spirit, alighted upon him and that God is in him. They could not believe how the Lord is symbolized in the story where he appeared and spoke to Abraham by the terebinths of Mamre as three men standing near him. The three men represent a host of the Lord's host. It's a man with divine beings. It's three persons. In my case, it's the person of Keith McCarty. It's the person of God. And it's the person of the Holy Spirit. All right here. And it's not new. This is all throughout the biblical, the, the Hebrew Bible. It just wasn't revealed to you. That's why nobody can believe it when they the final prophet of God said to be Muhammad of Islam. This is from Wikipedia. This the information I'm about to give you on uh, the, the, the founder of Islam, Muhammad Mafsasa. And then I had several comments to make on all of it. When Muhammad was 40 years old, he was commanded by God through his angel Gabriel to declare his oneness. And of course, God is one began with the Jewish people and the Hebrew Bible. To the idolaters of the whole world and to deliver the message of peace to the embattled humanity. In response to this command from heaven, Muhammad launched the momentous program called Islam, which was to change the destiny of mankind forever. He was in Hira when one day the archangel Gabriel appeared before him and brought to him the tidings that God had chosen him to be his last messenger to this world and had imposed upon him the duty of leading mankind out of the welter of sin and ignorance into the light of guidance, truth, and knowledge to be a light to the world. It should sound familiar to the Jewish people. According to the accounts of this Shia Muhammad, well, I'm working on this. Again, I'm just getting started on all this. Uh, and I have a computer in front of me because my cell phone is not responding correctly this morning. And the Lord wants me to get this done. Um, 
Gabriel's not an angel. Clearly, they plagiarized the Hebrew Bible and put into the, their own cultural laws and norms and, and what they consider morality. And, uh, of course, Christianity is, is based around uh, a story. It's that a story. They call it the greatest story you ever told. I agree. It's a great story. Billions of people have been deceived into believing it. Now, I can understand the people of antiquity believing it. But the people today believing it? Uh, I, I, I really don't know what to say about that. I, I don't know. I don't know how you can believe God made a human sacrifice to you and by his blood, by, by, by his stripes, we are healed. Again, God made me watch Christian channels. And, and then there's this one fellow. I will sell you the, the blessings of David. I said, where, God, what where, where are the blessings of David? I'm thinking. And he said, there are no blessings of David. He's making it up. People believe him. They send their names in with money, and he says their name on the air, and that's what they really want. So, but there is no angel Gabriel. He only appears in the book of Daniel. He only appears in the book of Daniel, uh, who is not a prophet. And it is not a book of the prophets. And he doesn't speak with God. That's what a prophet is. And even Jesus calls him a prophet and uh, quotes him as a prophet. And he's not. Um, it's just story. I mean, come on. A bunch, of, a bunch of men standing in a kiln that's burning hotter than the sun. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> I get it. It's not going to happen. But you read the same things, the, the, the leaders of Judaism read the same kind of absolute, that can't happen, but because they like it, and they say our sages believe that, we believe it. Well, your sages lived in another time. Michael Scobat, Jews for Judaism, who also claims Isaiah 53, is the Jewish people as one man. Israel, as one man, they have gathered and crushed by disease and offered themselves so guilty at some time in history that I'm unfamiliar with. Because he doesn't say it's something that's going to happen. They act as though it already happened. See, uh, tell me a thing about Reese Judaism believes it happened in World War II with the Holocaust. But that was just six million. That wasn't all the Jews of the world gathered as one man in Israel. They didn't get long life. They didn't see the children. They didn't teach righteousness. Neither did Hitler, he's the one that offered them as these grand sacrifices because he reads an offering of oneself for guilt to literally mean, these are his words, it literally means a guilt offering. Let's go to Leviticus. Now, he doesn't say let's go to Leviticus. He says it's a guilt offering, but a guilt offering is an unblemished ram for theft or destruction of holy things, debts. It, what that has to do with anything, I don't know. Because he's, he's an anti-missionary, he's, he's pointing this interpretation of 53 away from Isaiah 53. But they, you know, they think they're forgiven of the sin. They're, they're not worried about theft they're, <laughs> and destruction of holy things. They're not worried about that. I don't know what he's doing except reaching. Really, really reaching. I think the description of a man marred so 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 much beyond human appearance semblance um and, and all these this you know play deflected that the holocaust just grabbed him and he just made it fit well that's what the christians did they make jesus fit they can they can argue with me on every single verse and if you've read uh watched my six videos on 53 56 videos some of them were just a half an hour but um, there's a lot to it and i'm the only person who's ever explained it this way is anybody who watches it that's familiar with 53 and uh, the commentators on it today you realize nobody's read it like this and nobody's ever connected the story of ezekiel to it and you know this atheist Pretty smart guy, but uh, 
you know, it's just like in Malachi 3. Every time God had me read it, I said, why is that angel leaving earth? <laughs> he wouldn't tell me. I didn't know until I typed it. I didn't get it. I didn't put these things together. I certainly didn't put Jeremiah into it. Uh, in this new code, I, I read the new code and just, huh, it just went on. It didn't even mean anything to me. Because I had no background in anything. Except for the Ten Commandments and Charlton Heston. It's a great show. But there's been some better Ten Commandments since. I've seen them all. But anyway, Gabriel appears in, I think it's two chapters, and he's described as a man. A man. Gabriel, a man. And it's in a vision. It's not, it's not something where God says in heaven, I have angels, and it's the angel Gabriel and uh, Archangel so-and-so, the fallen angel, Lucifer. Um, you, you can't find that in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, it came from Christianity. So so Islam, which didn't begin into the 700s, common there. I think that's the date here. Um, with Muhammad, long after Christianity, which would have been... No, before the Talmud was put together, Judaism, when it really became formal, was with the Talmud, I would suppose, and putting the entirety of the Hebrew, by all the scrolls together and canonizing. <clears throat> and um, it looks like they plagiarized both books. Both books. And like I said, put their own cultural laws, rules, morality, and philosophy into it, but taking the basis. There's, there's Abraham. He's in it. And now, I don't know if Muhammad is supposed to be a descendant of him or not, but here's what happened. So, he is, uh, he says he's the last messenger, the last prophet of God. That's what's on their mind. It's not the last messenger, it's the last prophet of God. According to the account of Shia Muslims, Muhammad Mustafa, far from being surprised or frightened by the appearance of Gabriel, welcomed him as if he had been expecting him. Gabriel brought the tidings that Allah had chosen him to be the last messenger to mankind and congratulated him on being selected to become the recipient of the greatest of all honors for a mortal in this world from al-Islam, the birth of Islam and the proclamation by Muhammad of his mission. That's in Wikipedia. Muslims believe that the Koran was orally revealed by God to the final prophet, Muhammad, through the Archangel Gabriel, incrementally over a period of some 23 years, beginning in 609 Common Era, when Muhammad was 40 years old. That's an oral tradition. That sounds familiar. That's what the time it is. It's the oral tradition written. So it wouldn't be so it wouldn't be forgotten. The year, uh, and then he died in 632 Common Era. Muslims regard the Quran as Muhammad's most important miracle. He worked miracles like Jesus did. You know, he could bring tidal waves with fish to feed the multitudes. And Jesus said five thousand with two loaves and five fish, or, five, or two fish and five loaves, something like that, to 5,000 people. And um, a, pr a, a proof, his book, the Koran, a proof that he was a prophet, that God spoke to him through Gabriel, the angel. And, the, and that, this was, the Koran was the culmination of a series of divine messages starting with those revealed in Adam, of Adam and Eve, and ending with Muhammad. According to tradition, several of Muhammad's companions served as scribes and recorded the revelations. Shortly after his death, the Quran was compiled by the companions who had written down or memorized parts of it. That's from Quran in Wikipedia.
God shows his last messenger. And Allah means God, by the way. It's just not the God of the Hebrew Bible and the God of the Jews. God shows the, uh, the last prophet, the last messenger, long before the time of Muhammad, when Malachi wrote Malachi. The messenger. Is Elijah for a time to come? And the time still had not come. The land did lay desolate. But they had not returned. It did not bloom again. Until 1948. And even then it was a desolation. It took many years to get it going. And uh, re renew all the old cities like Jaffa and Hafa and Tel Aviv. <coughs> And, uh, of course, rebuild Jerusalem. You know, it's a metropolitan, metropolitan area now. Elijah, which, of course, is me. Now, how do you think Islam's going to react to me? We already know how the Christians are going to react. Not too favorable. Not too favorable. So this, you know, David is here because I'm David. David is here. I am the Moshe. I am anointed. Which means the man of Isaiah 53 is anointed. And the anointment is the alighting of God's Spirit on me. That's how I know I'm the man of chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Because there is no question that the Spirit and God are within me. And that's how I know this whole concept of God is in His Spirit. And I can point to Scripture that says just that. And explains things where it doesn't say it. Now, they believe, they believe Muhammad to be a prophet because of his book. I've got two books that I dictated to me with all of this information. This is, this is chapter 49 of Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord. See, it's not just about Isaiah 53. Now, the last chapter is the day of the Lord, and I'm going to do that probably on a separate video. I may make this uh, another two half hour recordings on my camera will take. So God's righteous servant, me. I am the final prophet, not Muhammad, and as the final prophet, and with the God of the Jews being the being the uh, Abraham uh, and Judaism, being the Abrahamic uh, religion that is correct there's three i mean if you really sit back and think about it who, who's gonna win that who's gonna win it's three are the christians gonna win it with their human sacrifice are the muslims gonna gonna, gonna when, I, when clearly there's it's just a plagiarization they're gonna be a light to the world peace and humanity And they got there by stealing somebody else's book. They took the book of the children of God also. The Christians attached it. At least they didn't attach it to the Koran. You know, I mean, that's a plus in their favor, I suppose. I'm going to go ahead and start into chapter 50. But they, I, I didn't know all that. I didn't know that they were using an angel that doesn't exist. And he doesn't. I've been in, to heaven and vision and told and know in certain terms that there's no such angels. There's no Michael. There's no Lucifer. There's no fallen angel. It's just part of the story because that's what the people in antiquity and, and today too, to an extent, I just like to believe in that. The Christians got so much jumbled up in their minds. So much of the religion conflicts and doesn't make sense. And they've got entire armies of demonic forces that are at war with God, this and that, I promise you. I know his power like the back of my hand. And uh, they, they, he, there's no contending with him. Whatever he thinks he is, he's willed it. Gone. You know, <laughs> he can take this world and turn it into a pea, the size of a pea, just by thinking it. He set off the big bang. That's how Genesis starts out, he divides. Uh, light from dark and this and that. Yeah. We're, we're the dark. That, and the division is the platform of heaven. 
And we're, we know we're in the dark because he had to put suns in there for us. So there, it's kind of a blend. You have to look. The first, the, the universe, his universe, the unseen realm, and then and then the real. The, real, the universe of real, which is like, you know, sol uh, objects, solid things, stuff you can see, came with the Big Bang. And uh, it's all within his original unseen realm. So it, we're, we're a universe in a universe. It's not parallel universes, just one inside of another. Totally different from each other. Science totally different. We can never see the unseen realm except what he would place in our minds. I mean, he can place an angel Gabriel in my mind if he wanted to and have me believe it, and I would. But he doesn't. He's very real and matter of fact. Um, and, and, and the fact that this, at this time, people are still believing the things of the people of antiquity who they didn't know anything. They didn't know anything. And they, had, and they couldn't back, they couldn't go in there and say, well, I'm going to check that out. I don't know about that. <laughs> you know, they couldn't, there's no bookstores, no schools, no teachers. About all you could learn from the wise man was the Hebrew Bible for the Jews. And they spent their life in that book. Well, I had it. I read it for the story reading when I was 50. And it's only because God was teaching me that, that I had the knowledge that I do have. Um, it's just not possible that any man could do that. And... I know I could. So, anyway, the day of the Lord. Now, this is interesting because I had kind of forgotten this entire chapter. The term day of the Lord appears in the books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Amos, Obadiah, Zephaniah, and finally, in the last book of the prophets, Malachi. In Ezekiel and Zechariah, the day of the Lord is said to be only against the nations, and then Obadiah against Edom and Esau, Christianity, and the nations. If you see Edom and Esau, it's Christianity. That's, that's just Judaism. If you're going to take their book, take all of it. Take the old tradition with it, Christians. They're one, they go together. The prophets warn that the day of the Lord is near. But it is not the end of the world. Now, this is true of the Essenes, too. The, uh, the sect of, uh, of Jews who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. But, and, and with the same concept, evil's going to be gone, but the good stays. Uh, um, the destiny of the world will be, will be changed. God returns to the earth to dwell among his people in his sanctuary, which he's doing, on his holy mount Zion in Jerusalem, and the world will know that he sanctifies Israel. Lo, the day of the Lord is coming with pitiless fury and wrath to make the earth a desolation, to wipe out the sinners upon it. Isaiah 13 and 9. You say, well, see, that's not, you, you have not thought about that day of the Lord. It's a half. God's final word on it. Because that's not going to happen. That, 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 again, that's just fun to read. It scares people, man. Whoa. You know, war's coming kind of thing. For a day is near, a day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of cloud, an hour of invading nations. A sword shall pierce Egypt. And Nubia shall be seized with trembling when men fall slain in Egypt and her wealth is seized and her foundations are overthrown. Nubia, Put, and Lud. These are, these are names for, the ter for territories that are pre-biblical for the most. They're pre-Abraham. <laughs> the Hebrew. And all the mixed populations and cub and the inhabitants of the allied country shall fall by the sword with them. Ezekiel. Ezekiel has an account of all the tribes returning to the promised land and they go all go individually back to the lots of their ancestors. 
their ancestors. Do you know how many? It is impossible to determine that. Randam says, I can do it. I can tell you another thing. He says, I do it by a spirit and has no concept whatsoever that God is in his spirit. That the spirit that relies upon me is one of being able to determine your ancestry all the way back to the to the partitioning of the promised land and to the tribe you should belong to that you have the most blood of. Okay. Sounds great, Ezekiel. I'm sure people love it, but uh, not that I have not that I have the best. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that David's here, the peace in the world. I'm here. You, it's, a, it's just about undeniable. This is like a hundred times more proof than Moses said. You know, it, nobody even knew he was writing the first the Torah. Nobody, I'm sure nobody knew. And if they didn't know, they didn't care. And the fact that God was telling them, they may have believed they may not have. Any of them would, would, would ask him, how do we know you're talking to God? Today, he say, well, read this. It's called Leviticus. You think I woke up and wrote God's laws without him telling me what to do? Because I thought that's what he was telling? That's the Christian. I'm getting the word. I'm getting the word from the word. For some reason, they call Jesus the word before he came into body. <coughs> so they get a word from the word. I, I, the word, I think, means God. I'm not, I'm not sure. But everyone who invokes the name of the Lord shall escape, for there shall be a remnant on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised. Anyone who invokes the Lord will be among the survivors. That's from Job. For I have noted how many of your crimes and how countless your sins, you enemies of the righteous, you takers of bribes, you who subvert, subvert in the gate, the cause of the needy. Assuredly, at such a time, the prudent man keeps silent, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live, and that the Lord, the God of hosts, may truly be with you, as you think, hate evil. So here's some morality in a great story. Hey, the Lord, and love good, and establish justice in the gate. Again, the Essenes had gates. People like to hang out at them, as you can imagine, and tell stories. And what else are they going to do if they have enough food and everything? And be and have all your friends clapping you on the back. Great stuff. Great stuff. Look at all those Gentiles gathering around. Tell that Jesus story. Tell the Jesus story. They, 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 look at it. They, they get all giddy. And he's some money. Yeah, it could have. It could be like that. And uh, I got a real long, I'm going to skip this one from Zechariah, but, but finishing up with Zephaniah on this uh, uh, coming of the end of evil. And I will bring distress upon them that they should walk like blind men because they had been sinned against the Lord. And their blood should be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Okay, you're going to let me read a little bit of this one. This is from Jack O'Brien. Now, see, this is like watching a zombie movie. This is like watching a heart show. And we are, you know, most people love to see those every so often, especially as, uh, when you're young. As for those people that warred against Jerusalem, the Lord will smite them with this plague. Their flesh shall rot away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall rot in their sights. And their tongues shall rot away in their mouths. In that day, a great panic from the Lord shall fall upon them. And everyone shall snatch at the hand of another. And everyone raise his hand against everyone else. Jews shall join the fighting in Jerusalem. The same plague shall strike the horses, the mules, the camels, and the asses. The plague shall affect all the animals in those camps. And on and on. Malachi 3 brings a new concept to the day of the Lord. Why is that? 
because it's not going to be in antiquity in Jesus' time. It's not going to be in the Middle Ages. It's going to be in the age of the internet, knowledge, science, medicine, common sense, or as I like reasoning, and even the lights in there. But it's still fun to read. This is the thing he was writing for antiquity because this is the kind of stuff they, they not only, they would believe these stories. And, and uh, today, we don't believe them. We just think, wow, that's fun to read. So God was writing it for different areas. He, he wrote for antiquity in the Middle Ages. And then we had the Age of Enlightenment kicking off in about 1600. Computers in 1960 to today. Age of the Internet. So what, what new concept in the day of the Lord does Malachi bring? It's God's final word. On the day that he's preparing where the new covenant is delivered. And again, he knew they were going to be dispersed. And apparently he had a pretty good idea when they would be coming back. Okay, this, it's the final word of God. Not only on the day of the Lord, but with the new covenant. What's he saying? What, what, what's really happening? Get away from all these fun stories. He's coming with a covenant of friendship. He says, you're going to be safe from now on. The nations of the world is going to know I sanctify the Jews. The Jews were correct about the Abrahamic religions. Going to build a temple which shows I have sanctified you because nobody's going to want you to build it. You know, uh, the Gentiles of the northern kingdom imported by Assyria didn't want the second temple built. They, they, they obstructed the building of it and tried to stop it completely with letters to Cyrus. <clears throat> or to whoever was leading Persia in that, at the time they sent the letters. Um, and he says, uh, New Covenant, everybody's going to be sin free, holy seed, holy seed. And since he did the same thing with the uh, exiles, he, he never says, I'm making you a holy seed to build the temple. He never does say that. But that is what happened. And it's going to happen again. He's going to have that temple built, I don't know, 10, 20 years from now, I, I don't know. Presumably before I die, but now David, he died before before the building of the first temple. Although he had a lot to do with gathering all the materials for it and the wealth that went into it. <laughs> and and Solomon had a, had a home to the honor. There's always a lot of things happening again that are real. As a matter of fact, it took longer to build Solomon's house than the temple. So, he must have had a pretty honorable abode, right? <laughs> that and God talked to him. Um, now, God doesn't address the nations. As I started out, these different days of the Lord's in the various books, some are just pointed at Christianity, some is the nations. Uh, you know, they're kind of different. But Malachi 3 is real clear. It's the Jewish people, the people of the land of Israel, as much as anything. Um, that's the focus. When I come back, you know, the sanctuary to be placed amongst his people in Jerusalem. Although the covenant, uh, the French covenant does not say in Jerusalem. I think that's pretty much implied. Although as David, see David purchased the temple not for God after he had failed the test that God put him to. It's kind of a... Uh, Making up for it. I, I, I've also been saying, and uh, I can go back. There's people who have raised millions of dollars to the building of the third temple out there right now. Just on the belief it will happen. God will come. They just don't know how because of the false teachings. Teaching of antiquity. The teaching teachings for people of antiquity. Well, the people today aren't of antiquity. Compared to those people, they are all brilliant geniuses. Every single person who has a computer is a brilliant genius. Knowledgeable. <laughs> Over these people. So, here's God. Not only is he saying something different than your traditional day of the Lord, he's saying, in future times, 
in the times where man is more enlightened, knowledgeable, we're just going to build sanctuary and everybody's going to be safe because it, that that's just going to keep people from picking on you as much as they are and they'll have it in their minds. Just don't mess with them. That God could be in there. Good <laughs> God might be there after all. Keep the, keep the Middle East at bay. And of course, you know, when I die, that's not to say God's not going to continue on them as he did with Solomon, with, uh, with Elijah, Elijah, uh, that was followed up by Elisha. Uh, the Davidic dynasty was supposed to continue the line of David, but I don't believe there's anything that, well, his covenant does. Well, my son's a great guy, and God says, you really want, would you want me to put him through that, what you've been through? And I thought, of, <laughs> I said, yeah, that'd be good for him. <laughs> I mean, I really wouldn't wish, I wouldn't wish that pain on anybody, but it changes to so much for the good. And you know, you can't really feel another person's pain. I know that pain. I still live in it. You can't imagine what happened to me just two months ago. Well, I can't, I'm not allowed to tell you, and I wouldn't tell you. But um, it was brutal. I, I, it, it, went, it went from... I have my top five things that he's done to me, and it moved up to, it, it went by everybody to number one. It made number one. I hope that's the culmination of those events. So anyway, lasted about three months. So back to, the, uh, back to this. So it doesn't address the, the nation, but only Israel and its people, which is all Jews of the world. Everybody in the world is forgiven. Doesn't mean you go to heaven, got to be in right sin. Um, and hopefully this is going to be, you know, there's, all the Jews aren't coming back to, to the promised land to Israel. But I think my presence, and particularly he built the temple, and then consider this. The nation, if you think the Christians are friendly to you today, you're not going to be saying that two or three years from now. Not when you can put in their face. We told you we were right. Because that's what they're always telling you. You, you, you know, you know, read your own Bible. That's Jesus. That's 53 Jesus. And you've got all the arguments that I'm putting before you. By the way, this Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord, every single one of the 50 chapters is summarized in a paragraph, a few of them, two paragraphs, as an addendum. If nothing else, you stop that, it's like six pages. I don't know how many pages, it might be more than that. Um, <laughs> okay, it might be a lot more than that. But anyway, um, yeah, if you're in a bookstore, just flip to the back, read the addendum, and just see all the different things that are addressed that, that really aren't Isaiah 53. The first 20 chapters, are kind of like you need to have this knowledge. You need to know about angels and God in his angel. And uh, a lot of I've kind of broached, but to moving on. God says, of course, you've heard this. Behold, I'm sending my messengers to clear the way before me to build the temple. And the Lord whom you see shall come to his temple suddenly. The messenger is Elijah in verse 23. As for the angel of the covenant that you design, he's already coming. I've talked about that. The angel of his presence brings the new covenant, Jeremiah 31. All Jews are forgiven of their sins and iniquities. And it's going to be when I get my books published. That's when it becomes official from God's mind. And even then, it has to be people who, who find out about it. Once you find out, whether you believe it or not, but when you start hearing your sin free, that's when... You need to avoid the evil inclination and really, really stress your Judaism and learning your Torah, which is the effect God expects Torah on your hearts. And he, God, revering his name, his name. Because you don't want to miss what he's preparing. <laughs> you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss watching the evolution of the Jewish people from Abraham. He's going to pick, you know, God's name will probably be, you know, Poindexter or something. Who knows? He's, he's so funny. But uh, I'm sure, okay, it'd be serious, God says. 
He said, we could, I let Keith cut up a lot. He's a human being. It's, it's good for him. And I, I play along some. But he'll tell you, it's, it's, it's not nearly enough. Or, or it's too long. It's not long enough. God recognizes that the forgiveness and equities and sins of Jewish people will not cause all to heed him. And in Malachi, he says, it, I know there are those that don't, those that do, I'm putting in a scroll of remembrance. In Christianity, believing in Jesus and accepting him as his one Lord and Savior brings sin and forgiveness and entry to heaven when he returns. You know, I've covered that. Even if you've committed murder and other crimes against humanity and God, and that's just not true uh, with the God of Israel. He's not going to have bad people up there. But it doesn't mean you don't want to practice Judaism. Because I know the Jewish people like to focus on life today. The, the, the heaven that the Christians dream of and think of uh, it's not first and foremost for the Jew. It's being a light. It's living life as well as it can with all these instructions God gave us on how to do it. And so this is this is bonus time. And God knew that. You just have to understand. He's able to play these things out in his mind as though he sees the world, the evolution of generations and cities being built and things being invented and knowledge universities coming in and he can just watch it all happen and he can see what's going to happen to the Jews. He knows they're going to get destroyed in Europe. And he'll tell you, okay, I'm not supposed to go into that. Maybe someday. But, um, but moving forward here, I just keep that in mind. He knows it's going to be a modern time. And here I am, and listen to what he's having me tell the rabbi. And you know what you, you know what the effect of that is? You know, it's not a metaphor like Torah on your heart. But, you know, he says he forgives sin, that makes everybody learn Torah. You know, it's really two separate different things. But uh, So anyway, God knew in modern times of secularism and reliance on science, medicine, and technology that his righteous servant might not be recognized. The utter destruction is simply on its way, just like it was with the Assyrians, Babylonians, and the Romans long ago. There's no mention in Malachi 3 of the destruction of the nations, as it is in, in some of the, uh, the books and chapters and verses that I, was, that I just read at the beginning of this video, uh, or at least on the day of the Lord. It, it is implied there will be in this destruction in the land of Israel, because God says, if he doesn't do it, when I come, it will be with utter destruction, as though there's going to be some, and there would be, to take the temple now. If there had to be something like the Six Day War, I don't think, I don't think Israel would ever just storm it and say, "Well, that's it. We're just tired of it. Just let it go." And unless there's some heinous act done, like a like a nuclear suitcase bomb, where they finally say, "That's it. Only Jews in this land, and we don't care what it takes." That's what they did to us. They just threw us out. Took everything we owned, took our bank accounts, took our houses, took everything, just said go. We had to walk to the promised land. But it's the building of the third temple. Now, oh, but I, I don't know. Where that. <clears throat> it's the building of the third temple. That's, that, that's what's so important. The seeding, the enemies of the nations that come against Israel, and the sanctification of Israel is the land and people blessed by God with his presence 
in his sanctuary is how utter destruction is avoided in the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. So it's the exact opposite. He's not coming to destroy evil. He's coming to safeguard the Jewish people so we don't see a holocaust again. He's, basically, that's what he's telling you. If the land were destroyed today by nuclear bombs from Iran, 10,000 missiles launched at the same time from Lebanon, and they'll kick, you know, the sling of David, the protective system to bring down rockets is never going to be able to stop that. And you got 7 million Jews there. And we lost 6 million in the Holocaust. Yeah, that's such a brutal thing, a brutal time. I still have a hard time understanding how we've already advanced so far, as awful as things are even today, from that. Well, people could, you know, the Nazis, they, they, they singled out children. That was their favorite kill. It, 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 <laughs> they were running low on bullets. Instead of shooting the kid or gas and gassing them, they throw them in those kilns alive. So, you know, that's just, a, 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 but, and it's a people. It's not some madman. It's not, it's not Dahmer. It's, you know, it's not, it's not just one crazy person out there. It was an entire country. And, and they didn't want just there. Russia was doing the same thing. They were hauling them out of their houses, making them dig ditches, and just going down, fanning them, father, son, kids, or kids first, then throw them in there. Whole blocks, whole neighborhoods. Uh -uh. No, I don't want to. some of the visions he's given me I, to make me really feel and understand. What, what, what would it be like for the Gestapo just to just break down your door and you're sitting with your family at dinner and you have no clue what, who they even are? And all of a sudden, everybody's being murdered. And, 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 and your girl's raped first. And your wife. I mean, and he put me into it. It's, you know, we can think about it and be horrified. But he can make it so real, it's as though you're there, but it's still different once you come out of the vision. It's a lot different. One, you're not scarred by it. <laughs> but, uh, I have a lot, a lot of things I'm just, that's just about it for the day of the Lord that I have. You know, this, this man and divine being, host of the Lord's host, you know, it's one God. It's, it's the oneness of God. Uh, of Israel, one angel, and that's the angel of his presence, who doesn't have an angelic body, and he's in, and one man, the Moshiach, the anointed one, and the anointment is the spirit of lighting and entering it. That's the anointment, there's, there's no oil, as in our world of, of the, I call it the real, and God's uh, world, the unseen realm, which is the universe inside the universe, and he's responsible for this one. You know, uh, he made a division of the heavenly bright white lights you can't even see in it. That he, he, he kind of shows me in visions uh, when we're, uh, we're dealing with David in the temple. It's not the same temple that's, that's on the ground here. It's different. There's still the temple, still got the walls around. There's a lot of similarities. But uh, in one vast room, it's that bright white light. And then the other is the king's throne and water coming out and flowing down the steps out front. And uh, so here he is in a future time. See, the time is coming in the future. In the year, it is the end of the year 2020 or, or anything like that. But, but again, he knew. He knew exactly what was going to do. He knew to come to me in 1957 or select me. When, when the first satellite was launched into the air by Russia, Sputnik. And he said that's when he touched my arm and just said, he really won't. You know, you say, well, how, how, how can you not, not trust him or not believe him or this or that? Because I'm in the final refinement. Lying to me is just part of it. And he finds it so humorous <laughs> to make me think I'm coming out of this thing. And I thought it, I thought it 11 years ago, I thought we were done with all the pain and shenanigans and, and adventures with, uh, with, with Christianity. Christianity knows you're here.
I said, hell, who's Jesus? You, you, you're the man Jesus claimed to be. Isn't that funny? Jesus, Jesus says in the New Testament to, to his people, to his twelve at least, do not listen to those who come in my name. It's kind of funny because if he comes, he says, I'm Jesus, then I'm not supposed to listen to him. But the fact is, he came in my name. He came as the teacher of righteousness. He came as the man of Isaiah 53. He came in my name, and that's given me all kinds of trouble to get this thing going, to do what I have to do for God, to keep utter destruction from Israel, to save the Jewish people. I've got these Christians who believe in human sacrifice. I've got these rabbis who believe a man of a hundred years is suddenly going to be thought a child in every single human being, every Chinese, every Korean, every Eskimo, every one of them, suddenly are going to go, huh, the Jews have been right all along. We need to exalt them. Let's take our stuff and give it to them and till their land for them. And, and look, there's no pain anymore. Huh, it's why God died. And this is the idea is that heaven on earth is for them to take what he believed in and a resurrection. So I got to deal with that. They, aren't they supposed to be protectors of the Jewish people? Follow God's laws. Have better lives. Morality. Look at, they, you don't just go hurt people. You don't, you don't keep people from doing what they need to get done with lies and false teachings. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I fell into the rabbis again. I call it a lie when you say the Jewish people gathered as one were, were stricken and plagued with disease as one and as one offered themselves for guilt to God, passing a test of devotion, and that they then went out and had long lives, all saw their children, and they made the rest of the world righteous. Well, let's see you do it, Israel. Yeah. Huh? Hey, rabbis. Tobias Singer, Michael Scoban, all of you people who preach Israel as the man, the Jewish people, described in Isaiah 53, I want to see you, since you want me to go build a temple as David, you want me to bring peace between the nations and throughout the earth, you want me to end pain in the individual, you want me to teach billions of Chinese how to speak Hebrew, that's what you want me to do. I want to see you make the world righteous. I'm the righteous servant, and I dedicate it, and I pass it to you. Now you like that. I'm not going to let you stop me, and guess what? I got somebody behind me that you don't want to contest or contend with. Because people throughout this land are going to hear this very speech about you and Jews for Judaism and Outreach Judaism, your 900-page book, which I shudder to even think about opening personally because of your mid-rationalized Isaiah 53, which you had posted on your Facebook notes, and I was one of your friends, and you said in it, share this with everybody. You gave me, you gave me the right to use it as long as I don't slander you, perjure you, and guess what? God had me type in Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord, which will become a bestseller someday. A big part of your midrash on the human sacrifice of the blueish rams by Hitler which shows that Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people. Six million of them. Well, that's all I have on my day of the Lord and uh, doing my job of bringing the wrath and bringing the record. I'm the righteous servant of David. I'm Elijah, the prophet like Moses. And soon to be published, a song, a new song God had me write. And I'm an eternal priest of the order of Metelsevich and King David, and a rightful king that would be leader. It's the same song David used. It's scripture. When David wrote it, God told him, David, write this down, a psalm of David. My Lord said to his Lord, 
And there we go again with Christians. They say that if it's the Lord and he's talking to the Lord, that's God of the Trinity talking to Jesus. What's the problem? One, one of them's capitalized and one's not. What was the other thing? Big, big reason? But just read it. It's a song about him. It's written by somebody who works for King David, a servant of uh, something in the kingdom. He's writing of him when you read it because he would be Lord to this man. He's a lowly servant. Yes, Lord. You know, he's a king. That's what you say. It's not Jesus. It's not meant to be Jesus. It's not a, what do they call it? Tiffany of Jesus? I don't know. God wrote stories that have meaning that's, that's just not right there until you know the story of Jesus. I got in with this since I apparently still got a little camera time. So, nothing is ever written about Jesus. Okay, nothing did these scrolls, nothing by them, uh, no commotion at the gate, as in gate with Jesus saying that, you know, you can't say you're the righteous servant because our founders is the righteous servant. And, um, there are no altercations noted in the New Testament. And it would have been, God tells me, a pretty contentious group out there. Not a lot of law abiders. But uh, I said, I know I have to deal with them. I think I was tough on ship side to deal with them. So, until, until 70. What happened in 70? The first big Jewish revolt, 500,000 Jews defeated. Battle after battle. People don't think the Jews fight. They fought for every inch of Jerusalem they could get. And then there was another revolt. And then another revolt. And they finally, <laughs> it's like being in God's fire. We're finally, they were in the Roman fire. We're finally, they said, okay, that's it. Let's get out of here. Thanks for the land, God. We got to go. You made everybody mad at us. We're saying we're the chosen. Well, well, so. This one, the first book, uh, you know, so you see these two rabbis, you know, trudging along through Syria and heading towards Europe. And, what are we going to do for money? What are we going to do? i got kids and everything. I can't go to Sunday without to make money. That's, that's, that's how I make my living. It's teaching the Hebrew Bible. His friend says, <laughs> says it's from a, that story about the Jesus. I keep money every time I tell that story, especially if I change it up a little bit. Every time I tell that story, boom, you know, I got lunch, I got dinner. I sometimes have food, but then that's that. They love it. You think how they just get all. I believe, baby, Jesus, falling on the ground. Holy rollers. That's where the first holy rollers came from. You don't know what that is, look at it. Since you got it, they love this stuff. And slow mo looks at him and said, Oh, you got to be kidding me. You can't put that story in the Hebrew Bible. You can't connect Moshe to that. He comes in, rides ass in Jerusalem, and defeats Rome and becomes king of the world. What are you talking about? We'll just change it. <laughs> Maybe it was the writers who were just people. They were people going there because there was no Jesus. Nothing written about me. Are you kidding me? Man, walking on water, feeling, feeding everybody, the blind see, the crippled walk, dead or risen. You think he'd have been, he'd have probably taken, uh, he'd have taken the, uh, the Roman leader's position in front of him. That's what he would have done and just made them leave. He'd used his head instead of trying to fight them hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. I guarantee you, the revolts would have had more success, although ultimately beaten down just by numbers. If God in me had been there with, with this unit, <laughs> this human body, or any other human body, just because he knows everything, he said, <laughs> it'd be more like the Americans fighting the British, hiding in trees and bushes and stuff. <laughs> so anyway, uh, thank you. Uh, Tell anybody who's interested in Isaiah 53 that there's a, a new take on it. There's new explanations. And uh, tell Mr. Leper Scholar, as from the 
the town, Babylonian town. And there's a, actually, it's quoted something, Sanhedrin 9b. I'm not sure if that's in the Talmud or it just gets spoken of in the Talmud. I know the Sanhedrin, I know what they are. Um, but I don't recall seeing anything that in the Talmud, Sanhedrin is like a, a special book or something, or some extra, or a section. I, I don't recall ever seeing that. And, and again, this is where, you know, God, uh, you know, I'm still human. I'm still Keith. And the way he does that is, I still, you know, I still can't find the car key. <laughs> if I had a car. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm the same old forgetful person. He keeps me forgetful. But I'm still a lot better than I was. Um, anyway. It was easier using my computer, but um, I don't know what it looks like on the video with me looking down so much. It's so much today I was reading and not uh, being able to... Uh, like Isaiah 53, it's on the tip of my tongue anytime. But uh, I haven't looked at these two in a couple of years. A day of the Lord. The term day of the Lord appears in the books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Zechariah, Amos, Abadiah, Zephaniah, and finally, the last book of the prophets, Malachi. In Ezekiel and Zechariah, the day of the Lord is said to be only against the nations. And in Obadiah, against Adam and Esau. Christianity. And the nations. Basically, they're saying the Gentiles in general, uh, and in particular, the Christians. Those who told you to get down and walked all over you. Those who took your book and called it their own. Those who told you your God had let you and came to them. Because you were such sinners. But isn't it funny? The only reason they don't consider themselves great sinners is because of a human sacrifice. God gave to them, so he wouldn't see them as sinners, but he saw his people as sinners and left them. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. The prophets warned that the day of the Lord is near, but it is not the end of the world. The wicked and sinners will be punished and justice established. These are some Excerpts from those books. Lo, the day of the Lord is coming with pitiless fury and wrath to make the earth a desolation, to wipe out the sinners upon it. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9. For a day is near, a day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of cloud, an hour of invading nations. A sword shall pierce Egypt and Nubia shall be seized with friendly when men fall slain in Egypt and her wealth is seized and her foundations are overthrown. Nubia, Put, and Lud, and all the mixed populations and Cub, and the inhabitants of the allied countries shall fall by the sword with them. Ezekiel, chapter 30, verses 3 through 5. Yet even now, says the Lord, come back to me with all your hearts and with fasting, weeping and lamenting. Rend your hearts rather than your garments and turn back to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and renouncing punishment. This is Joel chapter 2. <laughs> Verses 12 through 13. <laughs> but everyone who invokes the name of the Lord shall escape. For there shall be a remnant on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised. Anyone who invokes the Lord will be among the survivors. That's Joel also, chapter 3, verse 5. 
For I have noted how many are your crimes and how countless your sins. You enemies of the righteous, you takers of bribes, you who subvert and negate the cause of the needy. Assuredly, at such a time, the prudent man keeps silent. For it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live, and that the Lord, the God of hosts, may truly be with you as you think. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. That's Amos chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. Thus said my Lord God concerning Adam, Christianity. I will make you least among the nations. You shall be most despised. Your arrogant heart has seduced you, you who dwell in cliffs of the rock, in your lofty abode. You think in your heart, who can pull me down to earth? Should you nest as high as the eagle, should your eye be lodged among the stars, even from there I will pull you down, declares the Lord. Oh, and I. Chapter 1, verse 1. And I will be bring distress upon them, that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Zephaniah, <clears throat> Zephaniah, I'm not sure how to say it. Zephaniah, thank you. Chapter 1, verse 14 through 18. As for those peoples that warred against Jerusalem, the Lord will smite them with this plague. Their flesh shall rot away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall rot away in their sockets, and their tongues shall rot away in their mouths. It sets up. It goes on quite a ways. As Zechariah, Zechariah, chapter 14, verses 12 through 17. This on the side, this because we were cutting up and being funny. Myself in the spirit of the Holy God. There is a person. We couldn't put these videos on if it hadn't been for the coronavirus. It was my stimulus check, the, pant, uh, the, the relief check uh, because of the virus and the need for everybody and stimulate the economy. That's how I got this camera and a little light. And this big TV behind me. And his spirit asked God, where he asked him, I said, you didn't have anything to do with this plague, did you? He said, oh, you can get this stuff? He said, of course not. We looked at each other and said, we wouldn't put it past you. Any event, we laughed for an hour over there. Malachi 3 brings a new concept to the day of the Lord. It is God's final word on the day that he is preparing, where a scroll of remembrance will be written at his behest concerning those who revered the Lord and seen his name. That would include he, the Lord. He does not address the nations, but only Israel and its people. It is written for the return of the Roman dispersal. And why do we say that? It's because of the new covenant. See, a time is coming. That is for the day of the Lord. Because one of the sea of times is coming is Jerusalem is rebuilt, and then it ends with, and you shall never be defeated and overthrown again. Yet Malachi 3, the, in the, where God makes this declaration of the day of the Lord, when he returns, which is messenger, who clears the way for him, and the new covenant, the new covenant arrives with the angel of his presence. There's no other way to to uh, comment on that. that. That's who the angel of the covenant that you desire is. It's not the friendship covenant, it's the only other covenant out there. And I will bring distress upon them, that they shall walk like blind men. 
because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood should be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung, as I just read from Zephaniah. Okay, this is destroying sinners in the day of the Lord. And then this, yet even now, says the Lord, turn back to me with all your hearts, and with fasting, weeping, and lamenting. Rend your hearts rather than your garments, and turn back to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, and renouncing punishment. That's from Joel chapter 2. Okay, these are examples of writing for the people of antiquity. In the dark ages, that is prophecy, but it has nothing to do with the day of the Lord and God's final words on the subject for a time to come, as announced in Jeremiah 31 of the New Covenant. In the day of the Lord, he comes with his messenger and the angel of the New Covenant of sin forgiveness, not to destroy sinners or require their repentance, which I hear all the time. He'll come when we get all the juices of sinning and to be observant to the degree that we as human beings are capable. That would be from Jews for Judaism. And see, they rely, their interpretation of Isaiah 53 is the people Israel, the Jewish people as Israel, is based on the Messianic era occurring. You throw that out, and he's got nothing to back up that Israel fits all 12 verses. It's all based on that. It's all based on the nations and their leaders, the kings, saying, oh, we've been wrong about the Jew all the time, exalting them, holding them up high. Okay. Not to destroy sinners will require their repentance, but to forgive them and give them another chance. He also amends the first covenant to be mindful of the teaching of my servant Moses, whom I charged at or with laws and rules for all of Israel rather than strict compliance. And this is how Malachi starts again. Behold, I am sending my messenger to clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall come to his temple suddenly. As for the angel of the covenant that you desire, he is already coming. It's Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. And keep that in mind, because Jesus Christ uses that verse that I just read, Malachi 3 and 1 to describe John the Baptist, his cousin, as Elijah. But there's some interesting twists to it. The angel of his presence brings the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. God knew in modern times of secularism and reliance on science, medicine, technology, that his righteous servant might not be recognized, believed, or heeded. The other destruction of, I think it's, it's verse 24, I think, maybe 23 and 24, is simply on its way of chapter 3, Malachi. Just like it was with the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Romans long ago. Today, that would be Islam. God is his creation. And it's, he, he's not going to personally come down and destroy it as he did Sodom and Gomorrah. It's just, it's just another way of saying I'm going to raise up armies. You know, that were already there. But the Jewish people didn't heed his prophets and they were destroyed. Taking all these verses of Malachi 3 together, including God returning to his temple, which must be rebuilt, with his messenger clearing the way before him, 
a new covenant where God forgives the iniquities of the Jewish people and remembers their sins no more, which I have said is just an amendment of the first covenant, the preparing of a scroll of remembrance for those that revere and esteem his name and heed him and enter into heaven, and being mindful of his teachings and laws as observant Jews rather than strict compliance. The concept of the day of the Lord by all previous prophets is changed. The utter destruction prophesied, save for a surviving remnant, is alleviated. There is no mention of the destruction of the nations. It is implied that there will be destruction in the land of Israel, though not necessarily utter destruction. It's the way he phrases it. If you don't do this when I come, it is with utter destruction. Well, does that mean when he comes, there's going to be destruction? That it's only utter if his prophet is not successful? Elijah, in this case, who is, has the same purpose as the righteous servant. To build the third temple, there will be war in the Middle East causing destruction in Israel and the loss of life among the Jewish people, but it is the building of the third temple that prevents the utter destruction by the nations against Israel. And this goes hand in hand with when you rebuild Jerusalem, see the time is coming, I'm coming back. I have the covenant of friendship with Messiah, my servant David the shepherd. I'm going to place my sanctuary amongst you. And you shall never be defeated this first again. He has to come back. I mean, that, he said, when you get Jerusalem rebuilt, I'll come back. I, you know, clearly he realizes the temple's not here today. And he knew it in the times of Jeremiah. He knows it has to be rebuilt. And he knows he's going to have to be part of that. And to do that, he has to have a Moses. Of somebody who can say, this is what we do next. And he's got to have generals listening to him. And he's got to have, he's got to have the Knesset listen to him. And I'll probably, in my opinion, he won't tell me again. He doesn't tell me anything of the future. I have to figure it out for myself. Things that are natural to, to ascertain, uh, we'll talk about. But uh, I think it would be something like the Six-Day War. I don't think Israel will initiate taking that mount under almost any circumstances short of uh, a plot by Islam, including the Palestinians, to bring in a, a nuclear suitcase or two. Something like that may, may spark things without being attacked by Egypt and Jordan and Lebanon and everybody all at the same time, Iran and their back test Bible. <clears throat> Deceiving the enemies of the nations that come against Israel and the sanctifi sanctification of the land and the people blessed by God with his presence in his sanctuary is how utter destruction is avoided in the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. A day that is not one day, but will begin when he comes to prepare his righteous servant who is to be his virtual representation and spokesperson to at least, until at least, his return to his temple. A day that establishes and makes certain that the Jewish people will never be defeated and uprooted again. The Lord's way is cleared only if his righteous servant, who is Elijah, the shepherd David, the prophet like Moses, and of course the righteous servant. One description, four men. He can handle it all. But the way's not going to be cleared if the verses are being shunned, despised. thought to be afflicted by God, by the Jewish people, we're not going to get there. But I believe that changes based on the later verses. 
observant and secular alike, accepted as the shepherd David a leader to tend the flock and be a ruler among them, not as a king with a king. The day of the Lord is the last prophecy of God, and that day all remaining prophecy of God in the Hebrew Bible is fulfilled. The sending of the prophet like Moses, the descendant of King David and Elijah, with the delivery of the new covenant and the covenant of friendship, all fulfilled in one man, through one man, the man God calls my righteous servant, one God of Israel, one angel of his presence, and one man, his righteous servant, a man in divine beings. A host of the Lord's host, who is God's virtual representation, his spokesperson, and a man he has absolute and total control of from his mind, emotions, and body to his every act and his every word. And I am that man. Let me say something you say lightly, I can promise you. That you're listening to a man in the nine beings, that they are here right now, speaking to me as I read these things, having me skip when they want me to skip through my. <laughs> I said, You got to give me some of those. Come on. He said, We'll give you some of those. I see him change, change words that I'm saying. Uh, back, back to this uh, Malachi 3 1 and John the Baptist as Elijah. First and foremost, historically it cannot be him. Because when he comes, when he comes, that would be when Jerusalem is rebuilt, because he's in now a God three. And, and that of course is the verse Jesus uses. Okay. But let's just say, let's go back to his time. Number one, the symbol was there. I don't know what he was clearing the way for. And uh, God would have been coming with a covenant of friendship. To place his sanctuary there. I don't know why he put that in a covenant. But the most important part is it says when Jerusalem's rebuilt, which of course is already there, but when it's rebuilt, the Jewish people will never be the seed of dispersed again. Well, 40 years after the death of Jesus in 70 common era, the Jewish people had their first of three great revolts against Rome. They were decimated. Over 50,000 lost by some accounts. And eventually, this uh, the city dispersed from Rome with the temple being burned to the ground uh, during the first revolt. There was two more revolts actually after that. Um, and Elijah, of course, he, he died long before Jesus did. had his head cut off, put it on a platter. Uh, and his people came to Jesus, 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 John, your cousin. Well, he didn't say your cousin, John the Baptist. He wants to know, are you who you say you are? As in, I'm in trouble. I need your help. And Jesus' answer is, go tell him the blind see, the crippled walk. He can go to heaven. He said, go tell him that. I like the character. Dude, it just gets better. Why is he saying John the Baptist is Elijah? You think he doesn't know about the book, the scroll of Jeremiah? Never be defeated again. This is the man who said all the prophets said of him, he'll ride an ass into Jerusalem and be executed. But the only prophet who even talks about it is Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, verse 9. The Messiah shall ride a ass in Jerusalem, verse 10, and defeat them and call on all the nations to surrender, become king of all, which I suppose would be the Middle East. Well, he just changed it. He just flat out lied. Yeah. <laughs> he let his cousin get head chopped off. Lazarus had to lay dead for an extra day because he was late. Get him, man. I don't know. But here's the problem. We, I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, guys kind of surprised me with this, but I know it well. Malachi 
3, verse 1. The end of it is, and the angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. Guess what Jesus left out? There's no mention of the angel of the covenant that you desire. It's intentionally left out. It is a deception of no small means. He left it out. And why? He can't put it in. Well, Jesus, what's the covenant? Uh, simply is written. Of all the Jewish people. He can't put it in. So he left it out. But he had it. He had to. But he had, at calling himself the Lord, he had to have someone clearing the way from him. And he couldn't get around that part of Malachi 3. God says, I'm coming. And I'm sending my messenger before me to clear the way before me. It doesn't say to build the temple. But God says, and then I shall return to my temple so, suddenly. So, I believe that's the best way to uh, interpret that. Just left it down. Well, anyway, uh, I think that's a good elaboration on the Lord, uh, the day of the Lord. You know, those those early books before Malachi, they fit the people of antiquity. It's to scare them and to stop sinning. It's just to scare them. You know, God's not going to come down here and kill every sinner. he obliterate the planet. And um, in Malachi, he's coming with sin forgiveness. You know, I'm, I, I'm making a score of remembrance. You'll find out this sort of heaven that I'm building just for you, creating just for you, my Jewish people. I mean, it's so far removed from the concept of a day of the Lord um, that you just kind of perk up. It's because why? It's see, a time is coming. It's a prophetic day of the Lord, so to speak. It's not one that is in it. It's around the corner. It's, there will be a time when I come back. When I come back, sin forgiveness. I'm telling you, you only have to be mindful of my laws and my strict compliance. It's the same covenant. It's not, it's new only because it's an amendment. He includes plenty of confirmation that I am your God. The Jewish people are, uh, are his people. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. The leper scholar versus Israel in Isaiah 53, a guilt offering. What is his, the Messiah's name? The rabbi said his name is the leper scholar. As it is written, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him a leper, smitten of God and afflicted. And that's from the Sanhedrin 98, small case B. The belief that Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people as the man Israel, that is often attributed to Rashi, is now the prevalent teaching on the subject. Rabbi Singer of Outreach Judaism, Judaism is one of the most followed on the internet in his analysis of Isaiah 53 being Israel. His analysis is very similar to Christians in that he believes the animal atonement and worship laws of the Torah are to be applied to a man, to men actually, and women and children of the Holocaust. The Christians call Jesus the unblemished Lamb of God. Rabbi Singer says the Jewish people who were murdered and slaughtered in the Holocaust were ram guilt offerings for the purpose which might prosper of having the Jewish people return to the promised land. That would be God's purpose that might prosper in chapter 53. Rabbi Singer's commentary from his midrash, Isaiah 53, Jesus or Israel, on Isaiah 53, 10. This was posted on a Facebook page. The end of it says, share this with all your friends. In other words, 
anybody can use it. So, yeah. And everybody should know that, by the way. You can't just use something that's on somebody's site. Uh, but if you're giving the uh, authorization to it's a Seagate, it's okay, but you still can't perjure or slander them. I'm a lawyer. I don't practice, but I am a lawyer, and I know these things. So, I'm just going to really deal with 5310. I'm not going to put his whole, go through his whole address or anything. I'm like, it's the one verse that you can't just uh, prove by physical evidence. He offers himself for guilt. You know, all you can do is take somebody's word for it that you did. Except there is a little bit more. In any event, I am going to read, this is in quotes, there's no, I, I didn't do anything, I, I didn't even make corrections for this bad grammar or anything. <laughs> exactly as it is in his midrash on Isaiah 53 that he had posted on Facebook in his notes many years ago. I was a friend of his at the time. So I'm sharing it. I'm sharing his 5310, but I'm going to give my commentary on it. contrasting it with his commentary and the problems I see with that, which is not an unusual thing the Jews have always done, but in particular in the, in the times of the Talmud, Rashi, uh, Ramban, they were always writing about each other and what that person thought and this and that. So these, I'm going to read everything because it's in quotes and I don't want to, someone say I misquoted something because I'm not. So he starts out, and he quotes himself, 53.10. Hashem desired to oppress him, and he afflicted him, if his soul would acknowledge guilt. He would see offspring and live long days, and the desire of Hashem would succeed in his hand. Then he quotes 53.10 from the Jewish Publication Society. He doesn't say where the first one came from. I don't, I, I recognize it, but I don't know where it came from either. But the Lord chose to crush him by disease. That, if he made himself an offering for guilt, he might see offspring and have long life. And that through him, the Lord's purpose might prosper. This translation by the Jewish Publ Publication Society uh, of the Hebrew uh, into English began in, I believe it's 1956 from scratch. They didn't use, they didn't use old texts from the Talmud era. Uh, you know, the, the Old Testament of the Christians is, a, is from a Greek translation and then into English and translations are tough enough as it is without going through two instead of just directly one and the, and the, the, the rabbis and uh, scholars on language uh, who were involved with that process for many, many years um, began with the uh, Lindgren Codex, the oldest Hebrew translation of the Hebrew, uh, not translation, the oldest uh, Hebrew Bible uh, <laughs> written in Hebrew. Uh, it's a, and, and, and they, they translated it. It's, it's one that's been used for, for hundreds of years. So then uh, after giving these two verses of 5310 from different sources, here's what he has to say. Not only are we stuck with the same God punishment, God situation here as we were before this one is even more per perplexing. Yeshua was supposed to be the sinless, unblemished lamb that died for your sins on the cross. And yet it states right here that if he would have acknowledged his guilt, he would see offspring and live long days. The JPS, Jewish Publication Society, rendering gives a little different twist to an already sticky situation. It says, Parentheses, if this were referring to Yeshua, close parent, 
that the Lord chose to crush him by disease. I don't know if you can classify a cross as a disease or not, but I don't think hanging and being crushed are the same thing either. In fact, according to John's gospel, not a single bone of Yeshua's body was broken. Of course, this was stated so he could be equated with the Passover lamb, and John is the only one that compares Yeshua to the Passover lamb. But how could this be speaking about eternal Israel? Very easily. The offering of guilt in this verse is actually, literally translated as guilt offering. The significance between the guilt offering and the Holocaust is so astounding, even as grotesque of a thought as it is, I could not overlook it. A guilt offering is defined in Leviticus chapter 7 and goes something like this. The guilt offering is a fire offering in which all the parts are to go up in smoke and the high belongs to the one making the offering. I mentioned before that during the Holocaust, Hitler not only burned Jews in the ovens of Auschwitz, but he also used their skins as lampshades and their hair as stuffing for pillows. He sacrificed these peoples on the altars of ovens and kept their hides as his portion, but not until he worked and starved them to death. So, after the atrocities of World War II, the Lord's purpose had prospered because the land that was sworn to us is once again being inhabited by its rightful owners and is awaiting the final end gathering. The guilt offering, uh, that's it, that's it for the quotes. That's his commentary on verse 10. A guilt offering is a sacrifice made for unintentional transgressions. It was distinct, distinct from the biblical sin offering. The transgressor furnished an unblemished lamb for sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem, as well as in cases of sins against holy idols, theft, commission of fraud, or false oaths, with monetary compensation to the victims for their loss, plus a markup of 20% of the value to cover the priest's earnings. This is a guilt offering. An offering for guilt, translated by the JPS, says he offered, God chose to crush him with disease so that he would offer himself for guilt. That's the literal translation. The literal translated is he offered himself for guilt. Doesn't say anything about the guilt offering. Doesn't say he became a guilt offering. And God took his life. Doesn't say anything like that. The Jewish people murdered in the Holocaust had not made any unintentional transgressions against Hitler and did not make monetary compensation to Hitler if they did. It is the people Israel that makes themselves an offering for guilt in Rabbi Singer analysis, though he seems to be saying Hitler made a guilt offering to God of blemished ram. And these aren't the, uh, this, this isn't the unblemished lamb of God, the unblemished rams of God for guilt offering sacrifices. These were all just regular people. Everybody has some sins in their life. So they, they technically, you know, if this is what happened, I really can't figure out what he's done here, but I do, I do my best. I try to keep an open mind, but you, you, you can't offer an animal in any of the offerings that's blemished, defective, sick, diseased. You can't offer them. God won't accept them. And, and human beings are not a part of an animal sacrificial and atonement 
system, system of learning. Learning what sin is. Learning it can cost you. You might have to give up your prize to animal if you want to be forgiven by God. And it teaches you how to cook your food. It's a system he did away with through his prophets. Isaiah chapter 1, Amos, Psalms. He, he, told, he told the Jewish people. Not only did he say, do not sacrifice your children, which they were doing to the fire God all too often, <clears throat> but he told them, I no longer want your animals. Stop sinning is what it all boils down to. And this is even picked up in the book of Hebrews of the Christians. Basically, Jesus said, God no longer wants bulls and goats for sin. He has prepared my body for sacrifice for sins. The final sacrifice. His body prepared by God. I don't believe that any more than I believe God would accept a blemished lamb of God. Because, and I've, I've already shown the videos, you cannot deceive it. It's, it's written in the scripture with how he manipulated and lied and changed verses. He's a liar and a deceiver. He's a false prophet. He prophesied five times of his return and he never did it. And he even said it's going to be quick. It's going to be quickly. It's going to be quickly. That's been over 2,000 years. But basically, it was his generation. When he was born, everybody alive at that moment is his generation. When they're all dead, his generation's over. They're all dead. He said, I preach you shall see me in the time. Sounds kind of vengeful, kind of like the movies you see with the fellow getting ready to be electrocuted and tells the one I'm coming back. Harsh you. You, the people of Caesarea, there are those amongst you who will see me in the time. Remember they didn't. You, members of my twelve, there are those amongst you who will be alive when I return. No, they didn't. My favorite. Book of Revelation. The great story of destruction of all things and Jesus comes and the Jews that don't believe in him are not only killed, they're put in hell. Judaism doesn't even believe in the hell. If they don't believe in Jesus, well, why would you believe a liar, a deceiver, in a book of lies and deceit? People who believe in human sacrifice, being healed by the blood of the death of another. Do they not want to be responsible for their own actions as it is? It's a sick, sick religion. And if you need God, it's I need God. He would know how repulsed he is at the thought that he would offer a human sacrifice to anyone, much less the Gentiles. He doesn't give any. You, you sacrifice to the gods that man is dead to receive favor. What favor did the Gentiles give God with their presence in heaven? The continued sinning, I've been told. Jesus won't just forgive your sins if you accept him. He's going to forgive all the sins you make the rest of your life. Because he already knows you're going to do it. So he's forgiven. <laughs> I walked out thinking to myself, i got carte blanche. I can go do anything. I accept this Jesus. But no, I don't accept Jesus. Indeed, I don't think he ever existed to think he's a story. And I have good reasons for that. But let's get back to God murdering his children. I don't think Hitler offered them. So here's these brands. Somebody had to offer them, so God's going to offer them. Not unlike he offered his son. He, uh, there, there's no explaining. And I haven't even finished yet. So. Hitler sacrificed these people on the altars of ovens, these, these ovens to get rid of bodies of fire that become altars, and kept their hides as its portion. It's very interesting, because in verse 11 of Isaiah 53, the righteous servant who makes the many righteous receives as his portion the many, and as his spoil 
the multitude. The reference is to the people he's making righteous, the many. Many will be made righteous. A righteous servant takes the many righteous. Your portion, the many. You can keep your followers. <laughs> Maybe they'll donate to your uh, your cause, getting God's temple room built. But I gotta I gotta wade through rabbis like this. And Jews for Judaism and Michael Sobach who basically just ignores ten. It's so simple. If you're gonna use Israel as the man to be identified in Isaiah fifty three, who's supposed to be God's representative like Moses in the day of the Lord. But if you're going to use them, you're going to have to use them as God used them with Moses. You gather every single one of them. They have to agree to a man. I want to know when all Jews got together as one and were plagued by God with disease and brought to grief with sickness, that they would offer themselves for guilt to God. Be given long life and make the many righteous. How many people did the murdered Jews of the Holocaust make righteous? How many of them saw their children after that? None of it makes sense. And Hitler's portion, is it him? Did he make the offering? Why is he getting a portion? Is Hitler the righteous servant of God? That's what he's saying. It's, it's my Bible. And, and yet, he's got thousands and thousands and thousands of Jewish people believing this. And I'm that man. I'm God's representative. I am his Moses. And this is what I got away to. Those people that follow Toby, they'll throw you out of a group so fast, they're even suggesting, hey, it, it could be Elijah for the same purpose. They both have to make people righteous, bring them back to Judaism, and they both have a, have a task which might prosper. God's purpose in Isaiah 53 is not stated. We don't know it until Malachi 3, which is which is uh, where God announces the day of the Lord. And he says, I'm sending my messenger, who is Elijah. And I'm going to return to my temple suddenly. That's, that's his purpose. Okay, so pick him back up. Rabbi Sanger seems to be saying that Hitler is the man of Isaiah 53 who makes an offer of Israel, the Jewish people, which again would have to be all of them if you're going to call them Israel, as a Leviticus land guilt offering. And he and Hitler receives as his portion their hearts. Isaiah 53 12 says God's righteous servant which is Israel, and we're, and we're using the sixth name of the Holocaust as Israel, as best I can tell, because the the rest of the Jews, another sixth name, didn't offer that sixth name enough, and that's not what he says. He's saying God did it, because God's purpose was, I want y'all back in the promised land. So he murdered and created the Holocaust. I guess he raised Hitler up for that purpose. And I don't think so. I don't understand thinking like that either. I don't get it one bit, but that's me. I couldn't believe it when I read this. I really couldn't. And I'm going to offer myself for guilt. The guilt that the Jewish people feel from not being righteous, which is why they're sick and suffering in the opening verses. Who are the witnesses? It's not kings, as everybody seems to think from chapter 62. There's a reason they're in quotes. But... And then God says, well, you got to be suitable for my purpose. And the purpose is I want you to go make these sinners, these people who are sick, emotionally sick, from being unrighteous by being my righteous servant. That makes them any righteous. But you got to be made ready. And I have a process you're not going to believe. It's like getting a cadet ready to be a Marine or a Navy SEAL, except multiply that by about 10 million. It's in his power, and with me, he came to me in the womb to make certain that I live a life of suffering, filled with disease and injuries and 
or there's many other things. It's in the book. He came. He went to the Lord. He, he came to the Lord with Jeremiah to make sure Jeremiah was a priestly, godly man. <laughs> I was the exact opposite. An atheist for fifty years, and I had a serious spirit, just like Moses and just like Ezekiel. So, verse twelve of of uh, chapter 53 of Isaiah says, God's righteous servant is exposed to death. He is exposed to death by disease, from an affliction by God. God chose to crush him with disease. Then he says, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reward him because he was exposed to death. It's a disease, it's a sickness that can kill you. With me, it was cancer. There's other diseases that can kill you. Skin cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, untreatable lung cancer. And here is my proof that I offered myself for guilt. I said early on, there's no physical proof, but there's some indirect proof. I was told I had no more than a month or so to live to be prepared to die. Based on pictures of my lungs, each lung. Doctor said, do you see those? This is after colon cancer and chemotherapy for colon cancer that should have killed him. And he says, you see all those white spots all over your lung? He says, every one of them is cancer. It's growing cancer. I mean, it's too advanced to even treat. You should have come in earlier on the colon cancer. Yeah, so everybody get checked if you think you might have a problem or when they say you should go get checked. And um, he said, this, this spread quite a while back. I don't know why they hadn't already picked it up. They didn't pick it up until after the colon chemo. And I haven't seen a doctor since that day. Just walked out of there, trying to die. You know, quit work. <laughs> just walking every day. Uh, you know, I get stunned. I, it's just hard to say. And in many ways, I, I guess I was in denial. They said that's part of it. I guess I didn't even think I was really going to die. And, uh, you know, for the most part. And that was when the planes hit New York. That's 20 years ago. When I was 50, about seven to eight years after that, with the doctors, is when God first spoke to me. And again, I'd been an atheist for 50 years. I knew nothing. And one of the first things we did that week, he said, let's go to the bookstore. You need to buy a Tanakh. My response was, what's a Tanakh? I didn't know anything. I had kept away from all those people. And basically, he was with me. He made sure I did it. He orchestrated many things in my life. He took me, early on, he took me on visions uh, one, two, three a week as part of the teaching and just starting out the preparation process before the pain started getting really bad, uh, which has been up every year since. This is year 13 since he spoke to me. But uh, as you can see, he was starting to make a little headway. Um, five years teaching me, five years writing blogs with the other chapters of my book, Isaiah 53 in the Day of the Lord, which is dictated to me by God, just as the life of the righteous servant of Isaiah 53. That's my life. And he dictated it. God is my ghostwriter. Um, they're very interesting. And that's how I know all these things that all the great rabbis and the rabbis today didn't know about. That's my proof. Look at the proofs that Moses gave to the Israelites so they would believe that God had really sent him to have them released 